All right, so if you could start by please saying and spelling your name for us. Uli Benevitz, spell that U-L-I, and then Benevitz is B-E-N-N-E-W-I-T-Z. Okay, and today is Friday, August 17th, 2018, and we're in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm Richard Cox, talking today with Uli Benevitz, an owner of Weeping Radish Farm Brewery in Grandy, North Carolina, as a part of the Well-Crafted North Carolina Project. Um, so if we could start, could you just please tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, yes, I've been, I'm actually, um, I was born in South America, uh, Lima, Peru, and I moved to Bavaria in the early 80s, went to school in Bavaria, and then after high school, or uh, I fled to England, and um, did college in England, went to agricultural college, and then ended up in eastern North Carolina, and um, I've lived here ever since. How, what's um, agricultural college in Cotton? England. Which agricultural college? Yeah, what was that? It's called Newton. Uh, it's called Seal Hain Agricultural College. Uh -huh. um, it was one of those um, hybrid colleges where we had actually a farm on the college, oh. and um, we had to go to classrooms, literally like school kids, um, every day, all day. And then, in during breaks and vacations, we had to work on farms and then do farm projects, and then come back again. So it was not a university where you right. had to take a few hours of classes and then you're on your own. But this was um, it's a pretty intense program. Yeah. Um, but it was fun. I loved it. How and, long, um, how long was it? It was a four-year program. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and when did you come to North Carolina? 1980. Um, been here since 1980. And, um, and what the heck brought you to North Carolina? Started my life in Englehart, North Carolina. Nobody knows where that is. Um, <laughs> it's truly the swamp. Um, uh, I'm, a, As I said, I'm a farm manager. I manage farms for a living. I currently manage 27,000 acres. And um, uh, Englehart was my first project. Uh, they had a huge swamp. Mm -hmm. And in those days, uh, we cleared swamps. Now we create them again. Um, but in those days, uh, my first project was to um, an Austrian guy bought 9,000 acres of swamp okay. and he hired me to clear it. So I had 30 odd bulldozers and a couple of backhoes and drag lines and built a few pumping stations and we started to clear land and built now an 8,000 acre flourishing farm out of that project. Oh. So that was my first project. So that was actually your, your job when you came out? That was my job. That was my full-time, believe me, that was a full-time job. Oh, I, yeah. I was the only resident on a 40,000 acre farm. So it was amazing. We had bear and wolf and everything out there, and um, it was an uh, incredible learning experience. Um, yeah. We're the last ones. This is the last, I'm the last generation yeah. of land developers mm -hmm. at that time, uh, which is interesting because that was then followed by the Clean Water Act of 1982, mm -hmm. which put a stop to all the land clearing that was right. going on at that time. Right. And now, of course, 30 years later, we are reconverting it back into wetlands, some of them. And some were not. So. so what's it like? I mean, you're managing 27,000 acres of land still. Yes. That's um, So you're still employed by... I'm groups. independent. Yeah. Um, okay. I have investors who... Um, I've got Germans, uh, Italians, Koreans, and Americans. And uh, these are private investors. They buy farmland as mm -hmm. part of a strategy of diversification of investments. And um, then I manage it for them. And I find tenants, and the tenants farm it. And we do corn, soybeans, wheat. Um, in three states. It's North okay. Carolina, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Oh, okay. And how did you first become interested in the brewing industry then? Um, as usual, um, everything's an accident. Um, sure. Uh, in 1985, uh, while I was happily managing farms, my mm -hmm. brother who lives in Munich called me and said, brother, I've got a wonderful idea. I'll sell you a little brewery and um, she'll spit out beer and money. And of course, I believe my big brother and I bought it. And that was probably the last time I ever talked to him in my life. So, <laughs> so, so that's how I got involved in this project. Yeah. So, but you're, but so you weren't really. No, I've never, I've never brewed in my life, and uh -huh. I've never cooked in my life, which mm -hmm. is just as well because the beer would be awful. Oh. And so, so with the food. Um, no, but I just, it was just the idea was to build a little restaurant and have a little brewery and still farm, and then take your wife to eat in your own restaurant once a week. That was the plan. Yeah. 30 years later, we're still with 35 years later, we're still waiting for that to, to happen. So, <laughs> but that was the idea of it. So. No, that, that's great. And um, and so I just um, at the time it was you were were you looking at Manio at the time? Was no, the only reason why I looked at Manio was because I happened to live there. Right. And um, right. that's the only reason because this farm area I was working in is about an hour. Uh, my wife joined me in '82. She's from England, mm -hmm. and um, we. Um, 
she decided she wasn't going to live in Engelhardt. So we moved to Manio, which is a lot nicer. It's a little island mm-hmm. uh, called Roanoke Island. And, yeah. um, and um, so we moved. And of course, when this idea came up, it made sense to try to do that uh, in a tourist area. And I couldn't move because my day job was there. So I had right. no choice but to do it there. So um, um, the only problem was after we bought this brewery, um, somebody suggested I better check with ABC before we yeah. start this project. And, Obviously, I didn't know what ABC was. I thought it was some sort of school activity or learning center. Um, turns out to be alcohol beverage control. Yeah, um, this which is, is unique to this state. Well, I would say this is the only so-called civilized country that has such a thing. So, right. um, um, yes. So, ABC, I met with ABC and explained what I was trying to do. And they said, wow, this is an interesting idea. However, it's illegal. And um, so that was, it's always a great start to, to a project when yeah. you start like that. Well, I think I'll come back around to this too, but it was also a dry county at the time. It was a dry county in a dry town, yeah. which by the way, for those of you who are not familiar with dry towns, um, it's one of the bigger hypocrisies of the American South. Um, mm-hmm. We were a dry town, uh, but we had the biggest liquor store in the county in the dry town. So it's n- not, not as, you know, of course, run by the ABC. Right. And they also give you, they send you the alcohol and then they write you the ticket when they catch you driving with the alcohol. So they get you both ways. So. Right. So there was a lot to learn. Yeah, and that's... And as a European, by the way, I had never seen a half liter, I mean a half gallon liquor bottle in oh. my lifetime. This is a truly American thing. Oh. You, you, so, so, that was, that was, so that was an experience. So the, the whole thing was a learning experience. For it very know. much so, yeah. So I mean, when you found out that it was illegal, I assume you're still in the investigating stage. You're like, okay, I wanted to do no, this. this. The right. problem is my mother would have told you that I was the one in the family who never did any homework ever. Okay. And um, that's why I ended up in boarding school. And because um, I was more interested in fire engines and schools. And um, if I would have done my homework mm-hmm. before I bought that brewery, obviously I would have never done it. Okay. Um, because I would have realized that it was illegal and I would have never bought it. But um, if you don't do homework, sometimes you just get into these projects and then you figure it out as you go along. Yeah. But from there, and, you know, instead of giving up on it, you actually decided you were going to get the state law changed. Well, we had no choice. I mean, we yeah. bought this thing and um, I had a partner at that time who had the building ready to go and yeah. um, we really had no choice. And um, so the ABC Commission was actually the one, they were the ones who said, look, go ahead and change the law. And um, I had never heard of such a thing that somebody can pass a law, but um, they meant it. And they, they make it sound so simple. They, well, actually, it was really? amazingly simple. They, um, they helped me draft it, and I sat in the office of the ABC Legal Council, and um, it was, uh, at, you, I mean, people, it's unbelievable. I, at the time, at the time I was here on a visitor's visa. I didn't even have a green card at the time. <laughs> and I think that visa has actually expired at that particular time. So it was probably the only law that was ever passed by somebody on an expired visitor's visa. Um, I don't think you do that right now, by the way. Um, it might, would, not, yeah. might not work very well. Yeah. Um, the other thing about that law change, it was probably the only law change ever passed in this country with a single attorney hour being billed by anybody. Really? That to me, I'm still uh, yeah. at awe how that worked. Well, um, and I think you, there weren't even any lobbyists involved with it. it was really they asked, they, they said, you need to talk to a lobbyist. And I said, what's a lobbyist? I didn't know what a lobbyist was. Yeah. And so I met this guy and he was very nice. And, um, uh, and um, so they warned me about it. ABC had warned me about this. And um, so he asked me, how much beer do you intend to brew? And I said, I have no clue. And I wasn't quite sure what the question was all about. So, um, so I called my brother and said, how much does this thing make? And um, so he inquired and he said about 10,000 gallons of beer a year. So I turned around to the lobbyist and said, well, we want to brew at least 100,000 gallons of beer a year. And of course, the lobbyist said, no way. Mm-hmm. And then um, we started to negotiate with the wholesale lobbyist and we finally oh. reached a compromise, which at that time was 66,000 gallons of beer a year. So he could report back to his money people that he had cut me down by one third and he had deserves a raise and I was very happy because that was six times as much as we can brew anyway so it's what you call a win-win exactly. um, so that was my first experience with North Carolina lobbying um, so how was it like drafting that law it was fascinating yeah um, quite honest the, the real credit belongs to two other groups and not me um, the first credit belongs to Senator Bass Knight who was a legend in his days. Mm-hmm. He was the um, senator, pr- pr- leader of that Senate um, for North Carolina at the time. He was, that was his first term. 
And he was amazing. He was just incredible. And um, he said, I'll never forget his speech on the Senate floor when this law was introduced. And he said, this is only a bill for a little hobby project on the other banks. It's only for tourists and it has no financial implications. It, um, it, you know, it's just a little thing for my hometown. And, you know, we have a few tourists down there and that's what we need. And sure. um, it's just nothing that will amount to anything. And um, so that's how it got passed through the Senate. Um, now it's what a billion dollar impact industry or something like that. It's, so, yeah, it's two billion. What, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other one that deserves credit for this, mm -hmm. which nobody talks about, is Biltmore. Mm -hmm. um, Biltmore passed the wine law right. two was, years before yeah. us. Mm -hmm. I think it was 84, 83. And of course, Biltmore has the real connections and the real money and the real lawyers, and they did the real work. Right. And um, so they passed the wine law allowing wineries to sell wine in North Carolina. And I've never met anybody to shake anybody's hands. I wish I could sometimes. I hope I will go up to Biltmore and say, thank you very much for yeah. doing all the work because I got the credit and you did the work and certainly you paid for it. And um, uh, But um, they passed them and all we had to do really is wherever it said wine, not quite that simple, but wherever it said wine, I added and beer. And oh, um, sure. so that's how it got done. And then so, there was an interesting kink to that, which again is fascinating from a historic point of view. I looked at the Virginia ABC law. Mm -hmm. They're very similar. And um, this was in 84, when we got going. And I thought, well, Virginia. And the Virginia law said a brewery in the state of Virginia may have one and only one retail license in the state of Virginia. Hmm. And I couldn't figure out who wrote that. Because mm -hmm. laws don't show up. Laws mm -hmm. get written by somebody who has an interest. And um, I finally figured it out. It was Budweiser. Why? Bush Gardens. Right. Garden. They wanted a, a, a retail license for Bush Gardens, so they l wrote the law specific. And narrowly enough. And narrowly enough, but the irony of this law in Virginia is that Budweiser opened the state to brew pubs, which is the last thing they ever wanted to do. And of course, ironically, at that time, no one knew what a brew pub was. Right. So right. you talk about unintended consequences, it's hilarious that sometimes that's what happens. Right. So the Virginia law story is just as fascinating. Nobody talks about it, but that's how how we got along, and that's where I learned about it. And well, and that's the sort of lesson that still is, I mean, happening with the legislature here in North Carolina, I mean, <laughs> craft freedom um, legislation, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting how these things thread. Through. It's amazing. It is yeah. incredible how that worked, and that was the beginning, and and um, it was, you know, it was an interesting process, to say the least. I'm sure, yeah. It was passed in six months, by the way. Oh, really? You try to pass it all these days in six months, good no. luck. Yeah, you can't write it in six months. No, exactly. So, um, just adding to that as well, I mean, as you said, you're an immigrant. So you're an immigrant writing a law in a country <laughs> that you've been in for like, less than five years probably at the time. Yes, yes. So there's, there's a unique perspective there, there as is. well. There is. There is indeed, um, yes. And I'm very, very, obviously very honored to um, to, to be able to stay in this country and eventually I got my citizenship and mm -hmm. um, I'm on my third citizenship now so very few people have three different citizenships in their life so yeah. um, but I'm truly honored to have made you know come here and been able to do that no doubt about it a man of the world I don't know about that <laughs> <laughs> a, uh, a farm boy out of control I think is more like it <laughs> that's even better really so so what did the final brew pub law other than brew pubs actually allow? What came out of the process? The process is, is fairly straightforward. The, um, um, we have a three-tier system. Right. And um, which is obviously even now a very political animal. Um, it says a brewery can only sell beer to a distributor and a distributor can only sell beer to a retailer and they mustn't have any financial interest in each other. That's the three-tier system. It was based on two things. It was based on the English uh, system of the uh, in the Tide House, mm -hmm. where breweries in England basically, um, at some point in their history, treated the, treated the pub owners like slaves, mm -hmm. because the brewery owned the beer and the pub, and the publican just had to work there, and they could do what they wanted to as far as pricing goes, and squeeze them and do whatever they want. So that was one of the reasons why the three tier system was designed, and the other system, of course, was it's a franchise law. It is no different than we have today for good reasons, with cars. Mm -hmm. If you have a car dealership, um, you are protected by franchise law. Why? Because there are only five car manufacturers in this entire country. Right. And there are probably, whatever, 100,000 dealers. So if you don't have franchise protection and you invest half a million dollars in your franchise and then Ford decides goodbye, 
you go bankrupt. And mm -hmm. that's what the franchise protection was about. Mm -hmm. And of course, it made sense to have that for beer as well, because when we started, there were less than 100 breweries left in this country right. and over 10,000 distributors. So they needed protection mm -hmm. because obviously Budweiser, Miller and Coors, they controlled whatever, 90% of the beer business. So the franchise law made perfect sense when it was at that time sure. for the two reasons I mentioned. Um, the problem with these laws, unintended consequences, now we have 8,000 breweries and um, the franchise law is still in effect. And of course, it, we really don't need a franchise law anymore because there is no need to protect distributors because they have an unlimited choice. Mm -hmm. And my God, distributors now distribute soft drinks, water, milk, God knows what. I mean, right. really, I mean, they don't need protection. They are just a distributor, just like US Foods are. But they love to hang on to it politically because it's a money-making machine, mm -hmm. obviously. So sure. that's the political side of it. But I am not... I mean, you need to look at the history of this and realize what it was meant to do and when it was set up. It was not just set up mm, right. by rich folks trying to make more money and by squeezing small breweries. That was never the intent of this thing. So right. again, that's, you, know, you need to look at in a historic content and see where it came from mm -hmm. and what the purpose of it was. And now, it's, in my opinion, of course, it's outlived its purpose. Um, the more breweries we have, the less there's a need for franchise law. Um, but of course, once you're on a... Once you have a money-making donkey, uh, you don't want to get off your donkey. Right. Well, it sounds like, I mean, just to jump way forward to Weeping Radish for just a second, is like, I mean, you all have done distribution, but you actually pulled back a couple of years. Yes, we did. Yes, um, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to get into that? If you like. Sure. sure. Well, we, um, we started off doing only uh, on-premise, mm -hmm. and um, then we fumbled around, and... Um, the problem was we didn't have the space. We were in a 5,000 square foot building that was mostly restaurant and 400 square foot brewery and you can't right. do anything with that. And we had wetlands on one side and other jurisdictions on the other side and the town of Manua hated us anyway. So they told us up front, if they ever catch you sell a keg of beer off premise, we'll shut you down because yeah. you're not supposed to be in the wholesale business in a, com a commercial space. So we started doing contract brewing and um, uh, that doesn't work well, for, or didn't work well for us, so we right. pulled back. Okay. And um, now we do a self-distribution only. Okay, yeah, because I fear it ties yeah. in some way. Yeah, tried, there's nothing we haven't tried. Yeah. Um, so going back to laws and legislation, so like I mentioned earlier, you discovered that only a brew pub was illegal in North Carolina, but you were moving into a dry county. So <laughs> what was the process of getting started in a dry county? Because <laughs> the, more, the more local you get with these things, the more thorny and personal <laughs> it can get. It got, it yeah. got, it got very personal. It, yeah. was, um, it was clearly not a um, love relationship uh, with the town of Manio. It was very much more a hate relationship. Yeah. Uh, they threw everything but the kitchen sink at us. Mm -hmm. They couldn't stop us, um, but they could throw bricks at us and bricks they threw. And um, boy, it was, it was something else. It oh. really was. It's, you know, this, um, you shouldn't do it. Um, of course, I'm not the most diplomatic person. Um, in the world, so I went to them one day and I said, look guys, what really is it you have against us? And they said, look, we are a family friendly town, you know, a brewery just doesn't fit into a family friendly town. So I said, I can be glad to help you with that one. And um, we had a little beer garden outside, so the first thing I did is build a playground. And um, uh, boy, they were spitting fire like never before, um, because that's the exact opposite of what they wanted to do and then I had little bumper boats in there, they were great. I put 50 cents in and the boats, well, there was a little pond there and you could remote control, drive your boats around. The town hated us even more because that was a magnet for children in the town. Well, I mean, they, I was gonna say they came there after school, we had a little ice cream shop there and um, that didn't help political matters if you do that. But um, I think you call that rubbing it in. Yeah. I, I think that's the right English word for that. That's a good phrase. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, the kids loved it. But the kids and the parents loved yeah. it. I mean, the parents, it was hilarious. I mean, the parents was great. I mean, the parents come in for something to eat and every five minutes the kids came in looking for more money because they need to run the boats again. The parents were glad to give their children coins. And um, I never forget my mother, who is very anti-American, uh, anti um, visited her wayward son in, in Manteo mm -hmm. and um, my kids at the time were probably eight or nine, uh -huh. and I never forget my mother's face. Uh, these boats were so successful that we had sauerkraut buckets of coins, 
and uh, my kids had to roll coins so we had a machine that we put on the kitchen counter and you roll coins that was their afternoon job was to roll coins my mother just every stereotype anti-american feeling she ever had was that picture there of her grandchildren rolling quarters on the kitchen table in America, that was just it. I mean, I don't think she ever came back to America after that. So, yeah. But it was very successful with, uh, with the, yeah, yeah. not with the local community, but um, it was successful for my children yeah. and uh, it was successful for the, for the restaurant. The parents loved it. Yeah. I repeated something mm -hmm. uh, years later in Currituck, in our new location. Um, we put an um, ice skating rink out there. We probably were the only brewery ever with an ice skating rink. and. Um, the, the idea was, again, very simple. I mean, ice skating and beer is a perfect combination because the more beer you drink, the less it hurts when you fall down. I, that was my idea of, of entertainment. And um, so we had a special area for small children again. And um, it was the same reaction because the kids, no, ki kids normally hang on to the rails yeah. when they're first time on skates. So I helped the situation by giving each kid a keg and they would walk around with the keg on ice. It was oh, yeah. perfect. It worked perfect. We have 50 liter kegs, perfect for that. You should have seen the parents and grandparents, they refused to take pictures of their grandchild with a beer keg. It was the same um, cultural experience that we had 20 years earlier in Mantia. So I'm still learning about the There's local... There's a little bit of a flashback. Um, yes, exactly. I'm still learning about the local culture. Yeah, so, so when you were in the dry county, I mean, was there anything <laughs> that had to happen with the local laws? No. I mean, as long as you stuck with... Like, no. There was a, you, we couldn't... As long as you we, stay we, where you are? We couldn't wholesale. We yeah. couldn't wholesale, and um, no, we couldn't. Uh, they couldn't stop us. Yeah, they tried everything. Wastewater restrictions. They tried everything. Yeah, and um, uh, and I mean, they really did. They shut us down for one summer. Um, they thought they'd kill us that way, but I was lucky. That was in '88, and I had just opened the brewery in Durham at the time. Right. And um, I got myself a tanker. It's a 400 gallon water tanker. I had a trailer and a F-150. And um, I spent my summer tankering beer um, in a, from Durham to Mantua while the town had shut us down and we survived one summer with a tanker. Uh, the town couldn't believe that we survived. And, That's amazing. Um, they, they could hardly understand where the beer came from. And by the way, when you do something like that, which may be slightly illegal, um, always make sure you um, do it in broad daylight, never at night. And if somebody asks you what you're doing, always tell them what you're doing. So sure. I always had to stop in Williamston to gas, get some fuel. And always, and always somebody asked me what's in that tanker, oi, what's in that tanker, I always said beer, and they always laughed and moved on. Walked away. And um, they never, obviously. Well, the image of this tanker, like, pulling through Mantia at the same time. Is, uh, it was yeah. great. Yeah. It was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think you're already, like, hopping all around this one. I'm sorry. No, 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 no I, I just lead in. No, this is great. Um, because I was going to ask what your greatest challenge is you remember <laughs> in working with local and state law. But it sounds like the ABC and the state themselves, they were really open to what you were doing. ABC is easy. Yeah. ABC was easy. I'm not quite sure about now. I don't know anybody there. Um, um, they had a um, very, very interesting legal counsel, um, a very nice like, uh, young lady. And um, she was wonderful. And the thing I remember was that um, in those days, America was truly in the boondocks. Mm -hmm. um, we had no coffee in America in those days, not just no beer, but also no coffee. All we had was in those days was Maxwell House, which I'm sorry, doesn't qualify for sure. coffee just as much as Bud, but it doesn't qualify for beer. So she had real coffee. So it was always wonderful to visit yeah. Anne at the ABC Commission because she had a real coffee machine and real roasted coffee. So we had a wonderful smell coffee first thing in the morning. So I had good relationships with ABC Commission. Nothing to do with alcohol, no. <laughs> but it's it coffee, it was coffee. <laughs> well, again, it's, it's building the relationship. That's right, that's exactly but, right. But, yeah, so the state... No, the state was easy. Um, the feds were tricky um, mm -hmm. because it was ATF at the time. ATF has changed a lot, they now call them TTB, mm -hmm. um, and they've refocused their mission. They're now chasing terrorists and not breweries anymore, which I think is wonderful. That makes sense. Um, but at the time, um, they literally treated us the same way they had to by law as Budweiser. And it was a horror show. Right. Um, they spend weeks and weeks and weeks in Manio. I've spent, I mean, my agent, I knew him, I knew his wife. She always joined him on Fridays for the weekend. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a correlation between the amount of federal visits you get in your proximity to the beach. It, sure. really, it, does, it does work that <laughs> way man, magically. So anyhow, what it was, of course, you know, we were the first brewer in the Southeast yeah. and they didn't know how to handle it. And um, they only, all their book, I mean, it's a rule book this thick, was applicable to 
um, Budweiser Williamsburg. Those macro breweries. Sure. Yeah. And uh, we had to have the same bond. In my case, an interesting one, if you had a brewery at that time, you needed um, an FBI clearance to be able to get a brewer's license. Okay. Well, because I was on a visitor's visa, guess right. what? Right. I needed a CIA clearance. So I'm the only brewer in America, I promise you, with a CIA clearance. Um, because, and they literally flew a guy, they told me that, they flew a guy from Paris to Munich and to go to my little hometown and check me out, make sure I wasn't a terrorist. And um, then he wrote the report and I got my license. So um, nowadays it's a joke. A TTB is, you know, right. easy as pie. I mean, they can't handle what they got. Right. Um, but th in those days, it was wild. It was really wild. We had an interesting dilemma when we opened up. Um, we were a brew pub. Right. So we only had two serving tanks. And TTB or ATF said you can't do that. Um, the law is specific. The law says um, you can only draw beer out of bond, which means pre-tax determined, in other bottles, cans or mm -hmm. kegs, which works for Budweiser. It didn't work for us. We didn't have bottles, cans or kegs. We just had two tanks. Right. And um, so um, then we studied this a bit further. And um, there was a definition of what a keg size was. Mm -hmm. And then there was a hog's head from way back when. So. We ended up with a little compromise. We took our um, um, our tanks, the dispense tanks, and um, we um, used them as sealed portable consumer containers of even quantity. That's how they were defined. Sure. And that's how we got around it for the first time. So this five barrel was a sealed portable consumer container of even quantity. The thing was, it nowhere was it defined if a consumer had to buy five barrels and take it home with it. And then they came back again and said, no, you can't do that because you, you have to, that sealed portable consumer container has to move from bond to non-bond. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, you need a wall between your bond and your non-bonded premise and a door to, to, do, you know, to get it through there. By that time, I was lucky because I was in farming, mm -hmm. so I was w working in some tobacco um, things. So I saw a tobacco warehouse where they also have bond and non-bond, and they have forklifts running back and forth with bales of tobacco between bond and non-bond, and um, they just draw white lines in their tobacco warehouses between bond and non-bond. So I said, "Well, good for tobacco, surely going to be good for alcohol." So we literally painted a white line right through the middle of the brewery, and then we took our sealed portable consumer container, pushed it across the line, filled it with beer, and pushed it back again. That's how the first beer was taken out of bond in North Carolina. So that's, that's great. And this is also all interesting because I mean, you know, not only are you dealing with having to change the laws, but the law, the original that even happened. But you're also figuring out all these. I won't say minor things, but all these things that you don't think about until they're happening that later on it's like people don't even think about it anymore. And you're like, I won't say you're making it up as you go, but you're having to deal with these things as they're coming up. Again, at the time they weren't minor. At the right, time they, right, were, exactly. they were two catastrophes. I mean, yeah. my God, every time, you know, you think what else can they throw at you? Exactly. What else is going to, and you know, we had no choice. I mean, we had to, um, I mean, we, it was just, you know, it was just one thing after the other. It was never yeah. ending. So. Wow. And then, of course, you had the local locals and the local government. Then we had the locals. And, um, and I mean, we, we were pretty stupid. I mean, you know, you shouldn't, uh, first and foremost, opening a brewery in a dry town is not smart. Secondly, to open a Bavarian-themed restaurant in the south is stupid as well. There aren't any Bavarian-themed restaurants in the south. There's a good reason for it. Nobody wants any. Mm -hmm. um, but it took me 15 years to figure that one out. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, it was always packed in July and August when the folks from mm -hmm. Pennsylvania and Ohio were in town, but the rest of the year didn't work. Mm -hmm. And then we, our biggest blunder probably was that, you know, we, we decided in 86, you talk about stupid, we only served our own beer in 1986. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what a microbrewed beer was in 1986. Right. If we would have done Bud Light and chicken wings, we would have had a chance with the locals. But microbrewed beer only? I mean, they wouldn't set foot in that building. Um, you know, but I was just typical, arrogant, thinking, my God, if you have a normal restaurant, you don't allow kids to walk in with their McDonald's food sets, so why would I allow somebody to come in here and have Budweiser? Um, that was my logic. It was stupid logic. It doesn't make any sense, but, but that was my justification anyway. Sure. So, so that was, we, we really, I mean, some of it was the background, but some of the mistakes were surely self-inflicted, and that was self-inflicted. Yeah. Um, so. so there were any... 
I feel like this is all we're talking about because of, of when it was happening. But it was like, I was going to say, is there any surprises along the way? But like <laughs> every, around every corner, there was a new surprise for you as Absolutely. you're moving forward. Absolutely. I mean, there was I mean, no end to surprises. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, that's what comes, I guess, comes with being a trailblazer. And, you know, then you, years down the road, you know, we had some restaurant owners come up to me and, and I asked them, I said, would you, would you, if we could, would you buy our beer? Mm -hmm. And they said, why would we buy you a beer? A, it's more expensive, and B, your competitor. Really? Bavarian restaurant? Um, they're all seafood joints. But it was the mindset at the time. And then five years after that, restaurant owners come up to me, we're now into whatever, 10 or 15 years down the road, and say, look, can we buy you a beer? Because all these people are strange. They want to ask for the local beer. And the restaurant owners didn't understand why people wanted local beer. So. So, you know, this is not Chapel Hill we were, this right, is not right. farm to table country, we were, you know, we were down there in the boondock. So, it was, I could watch this educational process coming along slowly, slowly, slowly. And now, of course, I had a meeting recently with a buyer at um, Harris Teeter and he's, he called it hyper-local. He said, we are in an absolute hyper-local world. And he said, I apologize for not carrying your beer right now in our, in our outer bank stores. But quite honestly, we really don't have a lot of interest in your being in the Charlotte stores because in Charlotte, nobody knows who you are. Mm. So that's where we are. That's how far we have come right. in this whole system in the last. And what was it like? I mean, because you're because you're you're seeing it happen. And oh, absolutely! It's happening slower on the coast than it was maybe. Way happening. slower on the yeah. coast. Way slower. Yeah. Um, I mean, we started. Quite honest, we started this farm to table in 2000 with the butchery. Right. And even today, if you Google, if you, <laughs> people ask me, what's the stupid thing about, what's that stupid name? And um, the name's really quite interesting because it was way pre-Google. Mm -hmm. And um, in those days, in the 80s, if you had a German re Bavarian restaurant, the only thing you can call it was Old Heidelberg or Old Europe or something like that. Right. And we called it Weeping Radish and everybody said, that's really stupid. And, um, but in comes Google. And if we would have called it, Hofbrau House or something stupid, and Google it, Hofbrau, find yourself there, good luck. Yeah. Weeping Radish, we own it. I mean, thank you very much. And yeah. um, that's, you know, and right now we're at the same point. We are a brewery butchery or brewery charcuterie. If you put brewery charcuterie into Google, there's only one name that pops up and that's us. So it's incredible how this is all evolving. 10 years from now, it won't be, but well, right now it is. Some of the challenges you talked about at that point but being Bavarian and being very specific in what you're doing becomes a benefit. It does. It does, obviously, because yeah. it's unique. Right. You know, if you ever talk about, you know, I own a brewery, um, well, what kind of brewery? Well, it's a brewery with a butcher and a restaurant and a farm. Uh, now you narrow it down to one. Yeah. <laughs> in, the whole, in the whole country, basically, that's it. There is only one that does all that. So, um, yeah. you know, it, it, yeah, from that point of view, it is unique. Yeah. So, you've you faced these challenges, you changed, had the laws changed, and then you're opening up and you were ready to move forward. Like, how was that? <laughs> Suddenly you're like, okay, we can do this now. Um, well, I'm glad I kept my day job is all I can <laughs> Okay. <laughs> because um, so I- So you were planning. Um, yeah, oh God, absolutely. I, without my day job, um, uh, I wouldn't be here today. And, yeah. um, so, but that applies to many microbreweries. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. There are many microbreweries that have day jobs and um, do it as a passion. Yeah. Or outside uh, owners who are coming in. Or same thing, or have outside investors that pay exactly. for it. And, uh, yeah. yeah, but it's a passion more than anything else. And um, um, I feel it's a fascinating um, passion and it goes way beyond beer, but um, um, it's, it's, it's a fun project. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess that's how it feels looking back as you went through all this and now you're looking back at this project and it's like, it's looking, but looking back to it, yeah. it is a movement. There is no doubt about that. Um, if you would have told anybody in 86 that we're going to have 8,000 breweries again in America, any, uh, even the West Coast right. would have laughed at you. Um, but it, it's, it's way beyond brewing. It's a celebration of craft again. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is the next focal point, and it's the young generation that is driving this movement. Mm -hmm. And um, and the movement, again, is, is the microbreweries are up, up front, um, but we need to see it in a completely different context. I mean, we need to see it as a um, regeneration of craft, um, 
And if you look at it from an educational point of view, um, the, um, the Germans have an educational system um, where you, our goal in this country is send your kids to college and I've been there, I've had parents, I've, I've been on PTA councils and if you ever suggest to a parent that their child will not go to college, they'll kill you right there on right. the spot because our mindset is as parents, our kids are smart and smart kids go to college. Right. which is the dumbest way of looking at all this because a lot of these craft folks are extremely smart mm -hmm. but a lot of them are not college material right. and um, that's why in hindsight looking at the German system their education goal is for every child to have a profession when they leave education and their profession involves craft training just as much as college or university training. Mm -hmm. So they define everything as professional training. Mm -hmm. And they've got these craft schools which are amazing. And it does, it's not just brewing, but it's baking, it's culinary, it is uh, whatever you want it. You know, these are all traditional crafts and they're coming back fast in this country too. Yeah. And this is a craft movement mm -hmm. which really is an alternative to our you know, we keep saying that the only, and even NPR, much to my annoyance, um, keeps talking about the only way, you know, if you want to get out of the income hole, get a college education, and only the bright kids go to college, and this, that, and the other. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the Germans, in Germany, I looked that up recently, um, their professional unemployment rate among academically trained professional is higher mm -hmm. than their unemployment for craft trained professionals. Mm -hmm. And if you are honest in this country, it'd probably be the same. Right. Um, but we need to rebuild our craft system um, from an educational point of view. Go to a microbrewing convention, for God's sake. The passion that's in that con building is palpable. It really is. Um, you know, I've been to a Budweiser plant passion my foot I mean the average age is 58 and all they talk about is unions and retirement yeah um, go to a microbrewing conference and those kids are on fire it is incredible yeah. and I've been to coffee conventions it's the same thing these kids talk about coffee growing regions I've never heard of in my lifetime but they have a passion for what they do yeah. and I really have a problem with old white people um, because they're always down on America and um, I keep telling them look you need to go to a craft convention and watch these that next generation what they the passion that they have mm -hmm. and a little more passion than these white old folks had when they grew up that's for sure mm -hmm. so um you know get out of the way and um let these kids get on with it and um because that's what it is it's right. they need to get out of the way and let this craft movement grow and um, it's baking it's charcuterie it goes on and on and on we've just seen the beginning of it great so now we can start talking about weeping rats. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm, always off, I'm always off to tangents. <laughs> no, that was not a tangent. That was totally part of this. So if you were going to try to describe weeping radish to someone unaware of the brewery, how would you describe it? Um, it's a work in progress. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's a celebration of craft. And that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. We started with beer. And on the beer side of it, I made, again, a huge miscalculation. Um, I thought let's do German lagers because if you want to transition from Bud Light to microbrewing, uh, a German, high quality German lager is an easier transition than a triple bock right. or a double hopped IPA. And um, yet again, I was wrong, as <laughs> nearly always. Um, uh, the craft movement went the exact opposite, they swung into the experimental side right. and um, um, because I was looking as the customers being traditional American beer drinkers, that's why I was wrong, the customers are college kids, mostly over 21, um, and they are, their mindset is I want to try something different. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the coffee culture, it's the identical. It is. You know, they didn't start off with a mild coffee, which was a vast improvement on whatever, um, but they started with Starbucks. Mm -hmm. And Starbucks is about as far away as you can get from Maxwell House as you possibly can. And Starbucks in coffee is exactly what a triple hopped IPA is in beer. Mm -hmm. It is way out there on the other side, but it creates such a wave that it brings another a huge amount of new people into that same market space. Right. So again, 30 years later, it's easy to, to see that. Um, 
I wish we had seen that, um, but we have stuck with basically with lagers from the very beginning, and now uh, we are in lager. We're known for lager beers, and the mm-hmm. way we look at beers different a lot of brew pubs, because we have a restaurant, <laughs> we have a family restaurant, believe it or not, um, despite what the mayor town of Manio said. Um, but um, but what it is is we look at beer as a companion piece to food, right? Which is very different. Um, there is impact beer and there's drinkability beer. And we are in the drinkability column. Um, we have a black radish, which is the mildest dark beer most people have ever tried. And it's truly a companion piece to meat. Um, it doesn't overwhelm the food. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a difference because there are a lot of beers that clearly overwhelm the food. For which as a mark, I'm not disparaging no, no. any style of beer, but that's, I'm trying to explain why I did yet again we, with the lager breweries in, in North Carolina, we are the, clearly the minority right. and um, somehow I end up always being the weirdo out, but, um, but that's my reason for it. Sure. Um, and it's, if I would have looked at that 20 years later, it's easy to say, well, sure, if I would have opened a brew pub 20 years later in Chapel Hill, I would have gone for the triple hop too because, you know, that's impact stuff, wow. Right. Um, but I wasn't and I never was in Chapel Hill, I wish I was, that would have been much easier to... Um, uh, and on that same base, we started that brewery in Durham. was an incredible story. Shortly after we opened, there was an investment club out of Germany came in and they said, wow, this is awesome. We want to bring German culture to America. Never a good idea. Um, don't, don't export culture. Um, but they had money and they said, look, you bu- we funded you build a brewery. And um, uh, Durham came up because I had a connection with Terry Sanford, Junior at the time, mm-hmm. and um, he pointed me towards uh, that part of Durham, which at the time was the highest crime rate anywhere in the southeast. Right. Um, so we put a brewery in the middle of the crime rate. Um, and um, we literally took a, an old warehouse and converted it into the most amazing 20,000 square foot thing you've ever seen. Oh. It was unbelievable. I mean, they gave me $2 million, for God's sake, in the 80s. And, yeah. um, but the, my problem was they only gave me 90 days to build it. And, oh, wow. um, what they'd done is, this was an investment club, so when you bought your share in this investment pool, you got a ticket for the grand opening. But we weren't allowed to start building when it, until it was fully subscribed, so we ended up with a 90-day building project oh, for a 20,000 square foot building, but we did it. We got our occupancy permit at 10 o'clock in the morning and we had our grand opening at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so um, <laughs> we had everything outside in trailers from food to plates to everything else, so, That's amazing. and we made it work. But the interesting thing about that project was it was 88 and this right. project was two blocks away from Duke University and I thought it was a no-brainer. During construction I realized I was wrong one more time because I saw a Porsche convertible drive by which was obviously a Duke student and um, professors couldn't afford those things mm. so he had a keg of Schaefer beer sitting on the back seat and I saw that from my rooftop looking down and I knew I was in trouble because mm. If you can afford a Porsche, you can afford a decent beer. And, um, but at that time, they didn't, and they weren't interested. Right. We opened up, we didn't see a single Duke student in that building. Wow. It was unbelievable. We had the Durham Symphony playing there, um, which was awesome. Yeah. We had Mahogany Booth, it was gorgeous. It was absolutely gorgeous. But um, uh, we had one event six months after we opened, and it was a Duke event, and suddenly Duke students piled in there. And of course, there was a fire marshal, another one of my friends, and um, uh, we could, were only allowed to let as many, as many people in. And these Duke, I was in, trying to keep them in line, and all these Duke students came up to me and said, Oi, is it true that there's a brewery in there? This is two streets away from Duke. And I said at the time, I said, Guys, when I was your age, I knew when there was a brewery in town. Yeah. I mean, but that was eight, today unthinkable. Yeah, I was that's the difference in, in what the difference 25 years makes. And it's interesting too, because if you, it's in the... Uh, now Duke is, I mean, no, Durham is one of the, my God, they think they've invented, invented beer over there. Well, and that's, what, it's interesting, because that's one of the things I was going to say, it's another point where you were actually ahead of the curve, and that yeah. now Duke, is, I mean, Duke, Durham is this place that... Absolutely. Yeah. And people are always saying, you know, wow, you're way ahead. That's great. No, it's stupid. You don't want to be that far ahead. It really isn't. It's not very smart. You need to be there when the market is there, not when you think you need to do it. Um, that's, it really is not very clever. Um, so, I don't, you know, don't give me any flowers for that one. <laughs> so, 
I won't ask. I'm sorry, back to the weeping radish. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think we were talking about the weeping radish. The next one that I was going to ask about Mantio when we first opened, but I think you've certainly talked about Mantio. It was the problem, obviously, was um, Mantio is a tourist town. Um, as we already mentioned, locals don't drink that kind of beer. Um, so we had basically a 90 day window. Right. And a brewery with a 90 day window is a nightmare. Right. A brewery is a fixed cost operation. You have to employ a brewer 12 months of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to have tanks, everything is fixed cost and year long. If you're trying to run a brewery for a 90 day period, it again, it doesn't make any financial sense. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to do a 90 day window, open an ice cream shop, because after 90 days you can shut up and close up and go to the Caribbean for the winter. Um, you can't do that with a brewery. So the whole concept of a brewery in a resort town with a 90 day window, again, makes no sense at all. Okay. So. So, so why did we do that? <laughs> no, well, you, that's where you live. Yeah, that's where I live. That's, that's where it. you were. Exactly. That's it. I still uh, live. <laughs> so, and actually you touched on this, but you didn't get into it, which is why did you name it the Weeping Radish? It was my idea. Um, but um, I explained, I had an American partner at the time, and um, I explained to him that in Bavaria they have beer gardens, and um, they have radishes as appetizers in beer gardens. And they are big white things, they're called daikons over here, and, um, and they look like a turnip. And they cut it with a spiral cutter, pull it apart, sprinkle salt on that thing and stand it up on a plate, it begins to weep. The salt will draw the moisture of the radish, makes the radish very mild. Mm-hmm. The trick is afterwards, when you finish weeping, they serve it on a plate. Then you take those slices with your hands, you dip in the liquid, and then you eat it. Wow. Because the liquid is pure salt water, right. makes you very thirsty, make you drink an awful lot of beer. That's that's the story win-win. of the that's a win-win. Now, that's why I tried that in Manio, um, one of the first menus we did. Beautiful German menu, absolutely ridiculous. Um, and of course, we had radishes on there. Um, nobody would ever buy a radish, no way. And then for the second season, we tried to give them away, and nobody wanted them. So we decided it was time to quit after the right. second year. So we haven't done them since. Or so, people uh, think of radishes uh, as little small. Yeah, the little red one. We use them for garnishes, obviously. But but right. that was the name of the radish. But as I said earlier, yeah. the thing about the the name is so amazing because it got us into Google mm. in a big way. Yeah. I mean, even now, um, it's amazing. Uh, so which is fun. Yeah. So beyond the laws and the <laughs> locals, what challenges did you face when you first opened Weeping Radish? Uh, well, I mean, as we already said, it's nothing but challenges, obviously. Um, yeah. Um, it was, you know, the time wasn't right. Um, and um, it was a, we had the classic example where we had a couple of local people who had relatives in Europe. Mm-hmm. And I would meet them sometime at the post office and they said, I haven't been in your place, but um, I have an aunt and she's going to come next year to visit me. And I'm going to make sure I'm going to bring her to the Weeping Radish. Because we were kind of the exotic place you go sure. when you had some weird people coming to visit you. That's really where we were. So, um, not a good business concept. <laughs> it's not not where you want to be. Um, so it's and, you know it's it never really um, it was just not a smart thing to do. Right. And it's ironic because of course now, as we all know, uh, the beer culture has moved to Asheville. Mm. And uh, that's where the capital of beer is for North Carolina. And uh, Mantua couldn't be as far away. From Asheville is you can't get much further than that, no. and um, so, and even that, but now finally in the Outer Banks, even we're getting a local distillery, and um, mm-hmm. we're getting there. We're yeah. getting there, yeah. S- kicking and screaming, but we will. But you're getting. There. We're getting there as a yeah, yeah yeah yeah. So what would you say is the main mission or theme of Weeping Radish? Again, the mission is um, um, hopefully. Um, well, the Weeping Radish has another component which you haven't talked about, that's a food component. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2000 we started um, with this new concept, which is what they now call farm to table. At that time they said, huh? Um, having a farm and a restaurant and a butchery all in the same place, they said, you've got to be crazy. Right. And um, we looked around, by the way, in 2000, and in 2000 there wasn't a single training facility for artisan butchering in this country. Mm. It did not exist. We had a couple, a couple of culinary school. By that time we had a couple of brewing schools, but charcuterie didn't exist. Mm-hmm. So we literally flew in a German, again, German master butcher and started all that. Um, 
Let me say something, by the way, backtrack a little bit about the brewing side of it. Sure. We started off with Ameri- with German master brewers, and um, by now I've learned something which is fascinating. Um, the Germans have this wonderful apprenticeship training program, right. um, which is second to none, which has an incredible advantage because if you are a German master whatever, and you have an apprentice, you come to work in the morning, you explain something that you want this apprentice to do. Mm-hmm. And then you get on with your job and the apprentice will come in the next morning and replicate the task that he was told to do the day before. That is more or less un-American. Mm-hmm. Um, in this country, you got an hourly guy coming in one day and you explain something, you better be there next morning and explain the same thing again. And the Germans fall apart mm. when that happens because they're not used to this sort of thing. Mm. Um, their training is so different. They have training for a start, but it is so different in the first place. However, and this is where Michael Brewing gets interesting, um, of course when we started the Germans just laughed at us and said, you want to do what now? Be in America? What a joke. Yeah. And um, now the Europeans are coming to America right. looking at microbrewing. Why is that the case? Because of the training that they do. Let me explain that. If you are a German apprentice, you have the German Master Brewers Guild defines the styles of beer for which you will be trained. And these styles are extremely detailed and, defi- and defined. So every student of the craft of beer trains as hard as they can and their final exams are literally scored as to how close they got to that standard that were developed by the senior brewers in the country. Mm. And the same is true for everything by the way, bakers and everything else. With the result that you will never find a bad beer in Germany. However, the flip side is most beers taste very much the same. Right. We don't have standards in this country. Right. Do whatever you want to with beer. Wake up in the morning and whatever, do a Christmas beer, throw some pine straw at it because it's Christmas. You can do whatever you want to. And um, that's why the Europeans are now coming to America. Because our craft industry is so different and we are so wild and wide open. Mm -hmm. So that we yearn on the one hand to have a proper training system, but they yearn to have this flexibility that we have. And this example for beer, by the way, I flew to Munich not that long ago, and my God, there are craft breweries now in Munich. What a joke! If you ever told me to be craft brewery in Munich, I mean, really? Um, they, they wouldn't have wouldn't have looked at a craft brewery over there. Now they're doing it themselves, and um, they have they're having fun with it suddenly. But they come to America to learn about mm-hmm. it. And I went to the craft brewers thing in D.C. two years ago, and there was a lady there in a Bavarian outfit on. And um, of course, I talked to her, and um, I said, "What are you doing?" And she said, "Well, I'm a hops grower. I am a hops farmer." I said, "Why are you coming to American microbrew event?" Mm. And um, she said, "This is the most fun I have the whole year because everybody comes up to me and wants to talk about hops, about different varieties, about different." She said, "If I go to a German beer event, there are corporate buyers there asking for discounts." And she said, it, I don't want to go there. So that is so fascinating about this craft beer right. trend in this country. And um, we're now seeing the same thing. I have gone through the same thing with butchering. Um, that has been the exact same experience. We were again 15 years too early. Um, when we put our first sign up there, we wrote butchery on there because that's the only word people knew. Right. 15 years later, guess what? We call it a charcuterie. Mm. Because that is a butchery, it's basically cutting steaks right. and the pork chops and stuff like that. Charcuterie is completely it's cooked, smoked, cured. It's a completely different thing. You couldn't have done that 15 years ago because nobody knew what that was. So we are going through the same process again. And I hate to tell you this, but the regulatory side yeah. uh, was even worse on the meat side of it than it was on the, yeah, because they came in and they still are. They still have that book. 800 pages Smithfield Foods and we have a permanent inspector in the butchery every day of the year supervising one guy because they haven't figured out that a one-man band artisan charcuterie cannot be handled the same way as a Smithfield food Chinese owned conglomerate well and that's what I was going to say is you have 
so many more corporate interests than the food side. And that's exactly right. Yeah. And I hate to tell you this, but I've been very, 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 very disappointed with our university system because I'm, I don't blame inspectors, they just there to look at page number 396 and give you a ticket, uh, just like Highway Patrol. Um, but, um, you know, the, the university systems are the guys who are supposed to be the food scientists. They are supposed to be the one who figure out that there's a difference between food farm to table regulatory mm -hmm. issues as compared to Smithfield Foods export all over the world. Right. Um, you know, when you do Smithfield Foods, they have this what's called HACCP, which was developed for NASA. Mm. Well, obviously, NASA needs to have safe food because once they're out and the food goes bad, guess what? They're dead. Um, so, you know, but, but you can't treat a one-man ban butchery with NASA standards, for God's sake. I mean, it doesn't right. make any sense, but that's what they do. That's yeah. what they do. So, eventually, that will change as well. And yeah. um, uh, I'm sorry to say, I've been through this twice, <laughs> once with beer and now with charcuterie. This is my second round to the yeah. same identical issues, um, trying to develop a craft system um, that is different from our corporate structure. Right. And um, so it's, but I've learned some lessons from the beer that I'm trying to apply to the craft. And, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Well, there's interesting parallels there. Well, they really are. They yeah. really are. And, 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 the, and the craft training really is the same thing. It is, mm -hmm. you know, it is an art. It's artisan. Right. It's different to factories. That's the whole point. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a brewery and um, all you do is have a computerized brew house and um, all you do is, you know, you pr punch in your program, um, that's not the same as having an artisan brewer who's actually interacting with the public and you right. know, doing niche products. And we now do specialty beers for individual restaurants. Um, and we invite the restaurant owner to come in and brew the beer with us right? because that's how you get the local buy into the local loyalty. So yeah. all of this was unthinkable 20 years ago. They asked us, to, as I said earlier, they asked us 20 years ago, why would I buy you a beer? And Budweiser is much cheaper. Now they said, can you do a beer for us, just for us, and I'll come and help you brew? So that's how this, where this is going. Yeah, it's great. That's awesome. So talking about loggers, um, you all you are a 15, 16 Bavarian purity law? Yes, right? we are. Yes, we are. And um, quite honest, it's, again, that's the, even the Bavarians admit, the honest ones, um, that that's, that's somewhat of a marketing gimmick. Um, yeah. Because, you know, no additives, no chemicals, no preservatives. Really, if you have a brew pub, who the hell needs additives, chemicals, and preservatives anyway? Here we are, the difference between distribution and local beer. Mm -hmm. As I keep telling people, you know, it's... Um, if you really want fresh local beer, we have a funny notion about fresh local beer. We now have these tap houses and we had lunch in a wonderful um, brewery today where they have 30 draft lines. Right. Um, well, they have their own beer, but these tap houses with 30 draft lines, quite honest, from a Ranetsky board point of view, is not a very smart way to go. Mm. Because think about it, you've got 30 kegs of beer there at the same time. How often do you think they change a keg of beer when you got 30 on there at the same time? Right. How often do you think they clean beer lines when you got 30 beer lines at the same time? And of course, the more natural the beer, the more often you have to clean your beer lines. Right. I went to a place recently in Raleigh, and it shall rename, in, remain nameless. Um, they use their draft lines as decorations in the dining room. I have never seen such a horror show in all my life. It looked absolutely lovely. They were lit and everything. It was gorgeous. But I mean, you buy a pint of beer there? Really? Yes. The first question is, how long has it been in the attic before, I mean, how many weeks ago did it leave the keg? I mean, it's a ridiculous concept. Um, if you are serious about beer, go to the right. Oktoberfest, for God's sake. I mean, they have 20,000 people in that tent. Mm -hmm. And guess how many choices you have of beer? Mm -hmm. One. That's fresh beer. Right. They fill those kegs in the morning. And by the way, they tap those kegs without CO2, mm -hmm. although they're lagers. Why? Because they never close the tap once they open a keg. They literally drain a keg in one go. That's amazing. That's beer. Right. Um, but that's that's farm to table beer. That's about as close as farm to table as you get. Yeah. Right. And that's where all this is going to. And it's not just the beer, but it's the food. It's collaboration with farms, and um, bringing you know all this together. And um, hopefully the bakers are next, and you know the charcuteries and so on, so on. All of this needs to develop as a culture. And it is an employment machine. That's the other thing we keep forgetting. Right. The microbrewing industry is a total industry. 
we have a market share of whatever it is, 17%, 18%. Wouldn't believe it when you go to a grocery store, but it's true. Um, but the microbrewing industry, with their 18%, employs more people mm-hmm. than that Brazilian giant. Um, so there's also an issue of, of, of employment in the craft field. Mm-hmm. And um, when we're talking about, uh, I'm not so sure about you know this our economic system, economics 101, uh, doesn't work in microbrewing. Right. If you think about it, um, any of us who've suffered through Economics 101 with the textbook that the professor wrote 20 years ago, um, it's always the same. Budweiser fits that criteria. They have the lowest ingredient cost. Rice is cheaper than grain. They got the lowest labor cost because they hardly use any labor. They got the lowest distribution cost because they've got fantastic logistics. Um, they have the lowest marketing cost because they control their distributors. They are the poster child of the modern economy. Mm-hmm. But guess what? Their sales are flat. Right. Every brew pub, every microbrewery, we are the worst guys. We have terrible labor costs because we employ real people. We have terrible ingredient costs because we use real ingredients. Uh, we have terrible distribution costs. I mean, really? I've got a van that runs around with three kegs at a time? I mean, give me a break. It's right. awful. But somehow, this is the new economy. Right. I'll give you this parallel of, of, of farming. Mm-hmm. You know, Walmart gets their most of their organic vegetables from China. Um, it's the most efficient way of doing organic vegetables. And they show up in this semi that, you know, is 24 pallets on a semi. It's fantastic. It works. You go to the local farmer's market. I mean, my God, there are 18 F-350s. Right. With everybody has got three crates of vegetables on the back. Really? And those things do eight miles to the gallon of diesel? I mean, it's an awful um, system of distribution. But somehow it makes sense to, you know, in this new economy, sure. because it's a local food system. So mm-hmm. you have to really rewrite that textbook, that professor. And he has a problem with that because he hates to rewrite his textbook. And uh, because he loved it so much, he's been teaching the same thing for 20 years. So mm-hmm. that's, where the, you know, that's where the change needs to happen is on that level. Yeah. So... 2000, 2001, you moved to Grandy? 2000, well, we started in 2001. We actually opened 2007. It's the longest building, oh, okay, pro- okay. Bu- longest building project in history. Yeah. But at the, at the, that's when you also took on the, the butchery. That's when we started the whole farm. thing. Yeah, we had, a, we had a 14-acre organic farm, butchery, everything. And we flew in a German guy and um, started the whole process. And, um, and um, it's again, it all takes time. As of this year, for the first time, we mm-hmm. have a co-op in North Carolina. Oh. A farm co-op and they do 100% free range pork, GMO free pork, um, and hormone free, antibiotic free, animal welfare approved. And it's a fascinating story. These farmers got did that and of course farmers don't work together either. Right. And um, so Whole Foods steps in and said we're going to organize you guys and Whole Foods literally organized this co-op. Huh. And um, now Whole Foods gets all their pork from this co-op. Just to give you an example how different all that is, first time we got pork from that co-op, the meat inspector shut us down. Oh, wow. Why? Well, if you listen to a Smithfield commercial about pork, it says the other white meat. Yeah. Why? Because it's indoor and they feed nothing but soybean meal and cornmeal, and that pork is literally the other white meat. Mm-hmm. If you have real outside pork like it should be, it's red. And the meat inspector, his book that he has, which is a training manual from the Holiday Inn, um, that's when he literally, he had never seen that kind of meat before. And yeah. um, so... Didn't know what to do with it. Didn't know what to do with it. They literally shut us down for the day. They shipped in a supervisor from Raleigh who had to clear it. That's how far we have gone away. But that's, that's I find so fascinating because we're literally going back. Yeah. You know, we're now talking about on-farm distilling, we're talking about on-farm malting again, we're talking about we're bringing this food chain all back together again. And people say all the time, you know, wow, you're way ahead. No, I'm just going back faster than most people. Right. That's really what we're doing. We're right. going back. I mean, this is another environment where we're going back faster. This is not your skyscraper with a bunch of offices and corporate boys in here, but this is, you know, we're going back to a different system. Sure. And yeah. um, so that's really the story about uh, our current location is now taking the next step and applying Reinhardtsgebot beer to Reinhardtsgebot food, cutting the food chain, which is currently 2,000 miles down to 200 miles and kicking out all the chemicals out of the food. Yeah, and, it, and it, 
And, and, it's, and you're looking at all these different things, not just pieces, but this is a whole thing. It's a whole, it's a movement. It's more, yeah. it's, and, and, and it's a health issue. Mm -hmm. Let me give you the story that, and please cut me off when you want to go back to somewhere else, but um, after we opened, shortly after we opened, Elizabeth Dole came, mm -hmm. our then senator. And um, I hate politicians of any shade, but um, so I'm, I'm neutral. Um, but um, she, was supposed to spend two minutes there or five minutes in a photo op and run out the door. She was fascinating. She really was. I was amazed. And she spent an hour there. But then she seriously said, what you're doing is amazing, but I don't think it's going to work. And I said, why not? And she said, it's too expensive. It really is not going to work. I don't believe it. So I told her, I said, let me give you my side of this story. If you drive back to Raleigh from the Outer Banks, the first town you get to is called Plymouth, North Carolina. Plymouth has about 7,000 inhabitants. They have six or seven fast food joints. And I asked her, you know, what else there is in Plymouth? She said, no, what? I said, a dialysis center. And don't blame McDonald's. They are an awesome company. How they make a dollar burger, make a profit, blows my mind. Plus, they've got the cleanest bathrooms in Eastern North Carolina. <laughs> but if you eat that stuff for 30 years, you will be on dialysis. And that is the issue. Mm -hmm. And the same, you know, that after, and I said, if you keep going, less than 30 miles away is Williamston, North Carolina. It's the same size town, same amount of fast food, and guess what? They have their own dialysis center less than 30 miles away. That is the issue about our food system. You either pay now or pay later, and we love to pay later. And she said, this is fascinating. I, I want my chief of staff to call you Monday morning because I want to take that up in D.C. I said, please don't. <laughs> and um, she said, why not? I said, because there's nothing you can do about it. And she said, what do you mean? I'm your senator. I said, ma'am, if you think you can convince your voters, that they need to spend more money on real food and less on iPhones, iPads and television channels, you will never get re-elected again. And she went very quiet and left and never heard from anybody since, which is exactly what I wanted. But that is the issue right there. Right. And we, this is what we need to change. And that's what this new generation is going, doing. Let me give you the beginning. When I, I, as I said, I've been in North Carolina since in, on the Outer Banks since 1980. Mm -hmm. When I came to the other banks in 1980, America was a true wasteland. We had no coffee in 1980. All we had was Maxwell House. I'm sorry, that doesn't qualify for coffee. Um, we had no beer in 1980. All we had was Bud Miller and Coors. I'm sorry. In 1980, my first glass of wine in America was something red in a glass with an ice cube in it. It was horrific. Now we have wine in America. We have beer in America. We're getting food in America. We are on the right track. Yeah. Europe's actually on the wrong track. Mm. Europe just discovered Walmart. They literally are. They have butchers and bakers dying like flies. Mm. And their breweries have done the last 15 years nothing but consolidation. Wow. They literally lag 20 years behind us. So we are now in the lead. Mm. And Europe is dragging behind. They've just discovered that it's much cheaper to have a factory in Poland making rolls and then ship them half frozen overnight to Germany. Nobody has to get up in the morning and make breads anymore. Right. We have the chain like that, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, we've done all that. We are right. now swinging back. We have our first bakery on the Outer Banks. All of our roll, our, our breads are locally made. Unthinkable five years ago, didn't exist. Yeah. So. And, yeah, and it's, like, it's not like something I heard you talk about before, which is the idea of applying the Bavarian purity law to, yeah, to food. food. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what this is about. It really is. It's the same, you know. I mean, brewing is exciting because brewing has taken the lead in all this. And um, distilling is next, and um, um, but it, it, it is a much bigger movement um, than that. And our health care costs will come down, but it will take 30 or 40 years because it took us that long to get them there. Right. Um, that's the problem with it. And everywhere we go and export our fast food, you can chart their health care costs and yeah. they'll go up everywhere we export this junk. Right. So, But it's cheap. It is cheap. And you know, at the same time, you go to a farmer's market, uh, Cabra, anywhere, beautiful farmer's market. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very proud they take food stamps, really. Um, I've never been to food stamps, but I would have thought if you have three kids and no husband and you go, to go shopping there and um, with your food stamp card, uh, you feed your kids for one meal and you're broke. Right. Whereas if you take that card to the local dollar store and buy enough junk, you can feed your kids for the rest of the week. Yeah. That's the problem with it. Right. So that's a social component. Sure. And this is true with beer just as much as it is with anything else. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can draw your voting right. um, thing with by beer. I mean, I can tell you who's going to vote for what by telling you what they drink. And food is no different. Sure. So we are creating a political 
two-tier system uh, based on that. Yeah, and and you, and that, you know, another thing you're talking about that seems you know really important to you is the idea of beer's connection to agriculture. Absolutely. And, and North Carolina still being primarily a rural state, it's interesting that it is an important aspect of it, but it's something that more broadly, even the craft beer industry in North Carolina doesn't seem to stress as much as it could. It's coming. Yeah. As we said earlier, there are now two malt houses here. Um, you know, I think because of my agriculture connection, obviously I'm very passionate about value added farming. I'll give you my best example. One of our best customers on the meat side of it is a dairy in Maryland. They're now outside DC called South Mountain Creamery. Mm -hmm. um, they're amazing. It was just a regular old dairy. The parents work milk cows for all their life. Um, they look it too. Um, and the son came along and the son, about 10 years ago when we started meat, that's when he started too. And he said, I'm not going to milk cows for the rest of my days. And um, because they were literally on the on the line of profitability and the parents just worked forever. And right. I'd known those parents, they're the hardest working people I have ever met. I stayed in their house, they're just incredible people. Um, but typical, the margins were so slim because they were in the wholesale business. So the son comes in and says, we're going to retail. So they started with milk, retailing milk, and um, wow, yeah. that operation is now the biggest employer in the town of Middletown, Maryland. They have, I think it's 23 delivery vans doing everything from milk to eggs to meats to God knows what. Um, they use the same software in their offices to schedule their delivery vans that UPS is using. That's value added agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, we have tried it on a much smaller scale. We do our own French fries and um, we don't sweet potato fries. And I, you know, if you have a small potato farm, uh, wow, you need to add value somehow, either by creating vodka or by selling frozen sweet potato fries. Um, and right. don't, don't sell sweet potatoes wholesale, but literally deliver sweet potato fries to the nearest restaurant. That's the way to add value, and malting is the same way. So yes, I do look at it as a agricultural, very much an agricultural yeah. thing. As and, well. and you know, you're talking about the malt. I mean, you all were actually the first invoice from Riverbend. Yes, yeah, we were. So, we were invoice number one from Riverbend. Which is I drove all the way up there just to get it because I was I was desperate for it. I just wanted yeah, to do that. Yeah. It had to happen. So um, it was it was fun. And um, but that's because I believe so strongly in that in that concept. Right. Um, and um, it it needs you know again, but it takes time to develop an infrastructure. Right. Look, when we opened the brewery, for God's sake, the only spare parts we could get was either Germany or California. That was it. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get a spare part for a brewery anywhere in between. Mm -hmm. Now, my God, we have a warehouse in Raleigh for breweries. I mean, it's it's like a wow. I mean, it's like a you know, kids in a candy store. I mean, wow, they got tanks, they got everything there. You just go shopping in there. It's fun. Yeah. But that wasn't you know that's infrastructure. But it takes a while to develop all this. Um, yeah. And. Um, Farming, the transition farming takes even longer. Yeah, it does. Um, um, so this might be a redundant question because you also own a farm, but how do you choose which local ingredients you're going to use in the restaurant and the you know, and, and a brewery? Wherever we can get it. Um, yeah. The problem, and you know, I do I do sympathize with restaurants um, with this farm to table movement because let's face it, it's not. Uh, all sunshine and uh, there's an awful lot of fudging going on uh, every restaurant these days wants to be farm to table even McDonald's wants to would love to be farm to table um, and you can't do it right um, and malt is no different you can't get consistent malt every week for the amount of beer that you want to brew mm -hmm. so you can only do it for specialties until it builds up over time mm -hmm. so it's just a process of trying to get the local malt people into business and feed them along until they get enough volume so we can actually make it a 12-month operation. Mm -hmm. The restaurant's the same thing, you know, every restaurant, Whole Foods had the same problem. I mean, they started with that problem. The, I admire Whole Foods, I really do. Um, they started with this local vegetable thing and, um, of course, you know, they did a wonderful job. Farmer whatever, John Smith got his cabbage in there, so they took a picture of John, put it on, above the cabbage and everything else, and then they started selling his cabbage. Well, the cabbage was gone after two days. Mm. but the picture still hung there. Mm -hmm. So now what? Yeah. They have to fill it in with something else. That's the problem. It's supply, supply, supply chain. chain. Yeah. And um, Eco in, in, in Durham is the company that does the best job on the 
fruits out of it to 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 um, feed organic local farm pro products into the main markets. They are the um, link in between, and they do a hell of a job. But that's one company, in North Carolina, doing it. Um, so it's again, it takes years to develop this. Mm -hmm. It took us forty years to get into this mess. Right. Right. So. 30. Why do we expect it's going to change in a year? Exactly. Yeah. So how do you think using those local ingredients impacts the flavor of the beer? Well, it, I mean, it, it obviously does. Um, yeah. uh, you know, are they better because of it? Um, I don't know. But, you know, can you tell an organic egg or local egg sometimes from, from, from a factory egg? It's a lifestyle and a concept that you need to embrace, um, not just uh, you know, are your beers, will your beers win every award in the world because it's local malt? No, because there are some damn good national maltsters out there. Right. So it's not necessarily that you improve your beer by buying local ingredients. Mm -hmm. And that's a big misconception. Sure. Right. And it's the same too with restaurants. Mm -hmm. Just because you use a local ingredient doesn't mean your food is better. Right. It's still the chef that makes a difference. Um, but you know, it's it's we just you need to look at this um, as an overall long-term, mm -hmm. healthy community-based system again. And by the way, the brew pub has become a community gathering. It really has, and that to me is fascinating. I mean, in the '90s, it started. We got phone calls from various parts, cities on the East Coast, from developers. They were doing a development. The first thing they're looking for was a coffee shop and a brew pub. Right. That's what they want in every development becomes mm -hmm. it, you know, and my my daughter lives in DC and um, she is exactly that generation. The generation before her working in DC, they always went outside, bought a house in some subdivision with a lawn and then raised a family and then they commuted into the city and went to, on, on the weekends to the shopping mall. My daughter's generation, hates the thought of all of that. Mm -hmm. They want to live in the middle of the city within walking distance of the coffee shop, of the brew pub, right. of the everything else, and it becomes a community-based system. There's a lovely story to that mm -hmm. out of England. Very recent, last couple of years, somebody opened a brew pub in England mm -hmm. with that very concept in mind. And you know what he did? He covered the entire brew, brew pub in aluminum foil. You know what that does? Heat. No, no, it kills every cell phone reception. Ah. Brilliant idea. Right, right. Because if you are community and then you have 50 kids that are drinking beer and playing on their phones, that ain't community. Right. So he was going to teach them a lesson. It was the dumbest business decision ever, I'm sure. It could, I could have had that because he could get nothing but complaints from his customers. I mean, that's a, it's a stupid thing to do. But I love the concept because it's yeah. just, you know, he's, he had it right. Yeah, um, well, um, yeah. But it's a stupid decision anyway, but it's, it's a fun, fun story. Yeah, I'm sure he took it out by now, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he had the right idea. He had the right idea, exactly. Um, so another area of interest is, you've talked about is the diversification of the food chain as well yes. as bringing in local. Can you talk yes. a little bit about what that means? Yes. It might be a counterintuitive to the idea of bringing things more local, but at the same time diversifying. So. Yeah. Um, well, it's value added, really, more diversification. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for, you know, for example, um, if you um, grow barley and um, you sell barley uh, on a small farm, you're going to go under. Mm -hmm. um, but if you use that barley to turn into malt and then retail the malt directly to your local brewery, um, there's enough value added in there that you can actually create a proper, profitable, sustainable business. Right. Um, I've gone to the point now where I'm not talking about sustainable anymore, I'm just talking about profitable more than sustainable because I really feel that strongly that, you know, unless we do that, we need to recapitalize rural America, quite honest. Mm -hmm. And what we've done with rural America is we practice what's called brain drain. Right. Um, anybody in rural America, if you have kids, you send them to college never to return. And um, this whole movement is literally going back to the farm. Um, there's a wonderful place near Chapel Hill. He did that. He has his farm there. And the first thing he did is converted the barn mm. into housing. And oh. now he has nothing but woofers in there. Yeah. And he creates a whole culture around these kids coming out of his farm and working. Right. And um, it's great. It, it, it is a, you know, it's a much healthier environment, not just for less chemicals in the food system, um, but also from a community-based mm -hmm. system. Um, so those are the two 
components that flow into that at the same time. Great. So swinging back around to beer in North Carolina, <laughs> uh, what what do you see? Again, having traveled as you have, what do you see as unique about Southern beer and specifically North Carolina beer? Well, it's interesting. I mean, when it started, um, and I guess we have to blow our own horn because we're North Carolina, but um, it was the West Coast and, and there was North Carolina and there was nothing in between. Right. And um, so we do have a leading role. Um, you know, Norfolk, Virginia, for God's sake, I tried to sell beer in Norfolk, Virginia 15 years ago. And you couldn't give away Michael Brewby in Norfolk, Virginia. Now they're so proud of their breweries. And you feel like saying, excuse me, where have you been for the last 20 years? Uh, and I feel like everywhere else, the same thing. You go, I, I go to Iowa now, and they have brew pubs in Iowa. Really? I mean, wow. Um, you know, that's, that's, uh, um, it's just... So we have a lead role, and I think we need to... And we have a very good geography in North Carolina, which lends itself to that. Mm-hmm. Atlanta, uh, Georgia is a much tougher animal because they have Atlanta right. and then they have rural Georgia and they might as well be two, be two different countries. Um, we have the coast which is a little bit <laughs> rural um, but then we have RDU and then we have the Triad and then we have Charlotte and then we have Asheville right. and these are all urban centers mm-hmm. and um, these urban centers are all surrounded by small scale rural communities mm-hmm. so we have a much better opportunity to tie, bring tie this knot, right. to literally integrate our rural, you know, we need to get back to where the rural areas around the communities become the breadbasket for the urban area. Sure. That's really where we need to mm-hmm. to go with that. And um, and you know, we haven't even covered canning or you know all this stuff right. that goes along with it and there's so much more to to, to do um, and you can do i mean we already have now chefs um going onto farms and doing farm dinners if you would have told right. anybody that a chef comes to the farm and charges 100 bucks for a plate uh 10 years ago was are you for real that's now happening yeah. so you know we are getting there and related to that you now i actually have a breweries i've been really doing what you've been doing sure. which is of food pairings, yep. either yep. in the brewery or yep. in a select yep. restaurant. It's happening. It's, yeah. you know, we are, it's in North Carolina geography. What I'm trying to say is our geography is much easier. New York is the same problem. You know, you've got New York State and then you've got the city. Um, wow, they're two different worlds. Right. And um, our state lends itself much better to that because we have this blend of urban and rural. Mm-hmm. So we have a unique opportunity to do that. Um, better than many other communities, uh, other states have in the Union. Sure. So you've been, you've been both or are both an agricultural consultant and a locally focused farmer. Um, so how do you feel that those two aspects of your life inform and influence one another? Well, it was interesting when we, um, uh, and I'm a farm manager and an agricultural consultant, but Sorry. it doesn't matter. Um, when I started, the local food movement was um, in its infancy. And in those days, if you were involved in local food, mm-hmm. you were politically considered to be on the left wing. Right, right. And um, they always got after them for being hippies and left wingers and God knows what. Well, when I joined, that was kind of tricky mm. because I was at that time managing 10,000 acres of land for Tyson Foods. So nobody can ever accuse me of being some left wing hippie, that's for sure. So th- that was always my wonderful role there. Right. Um, that. I wasn't the left-wing nutcase that they all per- perceived these others to be. I never did, right. but they did. Right. And now, of course, it's shifted. Mm-hmm. This is now the progressive side more than the left-wing fringe. Mm-hmm. So we've moved this thing. Um, but but it's, it's still, you know, it's, there, there still is a rural versus urban thing, but even on the large-scale farming, we're swinging back. I have two farms that I manage in Illinois. We are now growing non-GMO corn, Mm -hmm. and that is exported to Korea Mm -hmm. for Pepsi in Korea. Now you talk about crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, You know, for the last 30, 40 years, everything in large-scale American farming was GMO, GMO, GMO. Mm -hmm. And we are forcing other countries to buy our GMO stuff, even if they don't like it, um, because we're America. And now, wow, we're turning this thing around and now suddenly these farmers are discovering their niche markets over there and we're going back to non-GMO. Right. So it's, 
you know, and large scale farming is changing. Um, you talk about kicking and screaming, they really kick and scream. Um, because now we have super weeds and God knows what, and right. you know, they're beginning to realize that this dream that they had of easy chemicals is coming to an end. So you, you yeah. see a different, um, it's, it's, it really is changing even on that front. So it's fascinating to watch these two very different, exactly. uh, um, yeah. but they both have, are impacted by the environment, um, they're both impacted by environmental changes, of course. Uh, they're also impacted by the chemical use or the excesses of chemical use. Um, that it's it really is. There are a lot of parallels between those two. Yeah, interesting. So, what's it like to work in the craft brewing industry today? It, again, I all I can say is, um, you know. When you see, turn on the television at night, and you see all this negativism about America, about the future, about everything else, go to a microbrewing convention mm -hmm. and look at the optimism, look at the enthusiasm, look at the excitement um, in that industry. Um, it is amazing. It is truly amazing. If we can channel that and broaden that out, we can take a whole generation and correct the mistakes that have been made in the past, mm -hmm. mostly by white old men, by the way. So, um, so it's time to uh, push that. But that's really it's the enthusiasm in this industry. Um, and I've been to culinary schools. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Go to a culinary school, Johnson Wales in Charlotte. I don't know if you've been there, but it's a phenomenal campus. You walk in there and my God, those kids, they are awesome. I mean, every one of those kids you meet in that hallway will look you in the eyes, say hello, and see, ask if they can help you find something. Go to the average college campus, good luck. Yeah. Those kids slouching around, not knowing where they want to go with their earphones on. Um, so, and, and our whole goal is to, for every kid to go to college, really? Is that what we want to do? Um, so I think we need to wake up politically and from an educational point of view, mm -hmm. and really, you know, I, I, I see more people, when I started saying things like that years ago, I was worried to be attacked by university professors, they still do, um, but also by parents, mm -hmm. not anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you find more and more parents saying, you're right, craft is um, respectable, yeah. and I've employed brewers that the parents were so disappointed that their kid became a brewer because they wanted them to really become a lawyer right uh, really um, so it, that is changing it's a value system that is changing yeah and that to me is is uh, we have a future I mean if you think about the high-tech industry in this country what makes it so successful as compared to Europe is that enthusiasm mm -hmm. that young merging of cultures that makes it just blow up and try all sorts of things. And what literally the valley is for high tech, that's what microbrewing is mm -hmm. in this new educational system, or hopefully soon to be educational system, but in, in the new world of young kids as an alternative to just year old college, right. pile of debt, become a teacher and spend 40 years paying it off. Um, yeah. So. So where do you think this enthusiasm and passion can take the brewing industry in like five years? Um, I think a long way. I yeah. think, um, um, I, you know, I, I mean obviously the brewing industry as compared to distilling, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I would, quite honest, if I would be 30 years younger today, I wouldn't open a brewery, I'd open a distillery after they changed the law. Gee, you've changed um, enough laws yourself. I don't. I wouldn't touch it. Believe me. Um, <laughs> but it is the dumbest thing ever. If you're allowed to sell a bottle of, of vodka at your distillery to a customer a yeah. year, and you're supposed to keep up with it, but you can't sell him a glass, right. uh, a shot, really? Um, wow. Um, what religious uh, thinking went into that one? So never mind. Um, but um, you know, it's it, it's. I, I really think that. Obviously, the field is crowded for microbrewing. There's no doubt about that. We all agree right. to that. Um, but the brew pub concept, and the brew pub concept to me is where it is because you imagine this 
concept here mm -hmm. as a brew pub concept where you have a brewery on one side, a bakery on the other, a charcuterie on the third, a chef in the there somewhere, and then you have fresh eggs and everything else. See what I'm saying? You, yeah. you, you put all that together and you are doing what they do in the valley with tech. We could right. do with food, beer and craft and make it a craft hub. That's um, where I hope we're going to go five years from now. And a community. And, and, and obviously the community. Yeah. It would be the community meeting place, period. Exactly. It really right. would be because you'd have it all under, under one roof. Yeah. Um, so within those next five years or so into the future, how do you see Weeping Radish growing? Um, we are... Um, the, the food, the, the butchery is where the growth is going to be. The beer side of it, we're going to have fun with now. That's mm -hmm. fun, that's established, that works. As I said, we now do collaborations with local restaurants. We've never done that before, that is fun. Um, we have a German guy who wants to export Café Kolsch. Um, he's coming in two weeks. Oh. Uh, that's a unique project, uh, exporting a beer. Just one style, Café Kolsch, that's it. Just for that particular market. And of course, the marketing is, that's a German immigrant coming to America and then we import the beer back again. So that's, I can see something like that happening. Mm -hmm. But the collaboration with local restaurants is where I think the beer is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not interested in saying, we, I want to grow to 5,000 barrels, 10,000 barrels. I'm too, right. old, too old for that, that's not me. And then on the, on the charcuterie side of it, wow, um, the yeah. sky's the limit there. Um, you know, we haven't even done prosciutto yet. And um, that's the next step, doing cured stuff and do farm-raised charcuterie, charcuterie I and mean, prosciutto and things like that. That's the sky's the limit. On Sounds that. exciting. So it really is exciting. Yeah. It really is. We need more. We need to rethink the idea of our uh, education to the point where we need to figure out a way of doing it. We need culinary. We need um, tr um, craft training schools. Uh, we have the community colleges that for years and years and years, not quite sure what their mission was, other than enabling more kids to go to college. Um, we need to reconfigure that and create a better uh, training system, preferably with internships, mm -hmm. for all these crafts, right. to a more formal system of, of, of education. Right. Um, to catch, look, my, my example of that is, and you know, we've all talked about, we know politics of, you know, school shootings and all this stuff. Right. We have this attitude that now we have advanced classes. So you have a regular class, halfway through the class a door opens and somebody walks in and says, okay, the advanced kids now leave the class. Right. Go to an advanced class. Really? What yeah. does that make the other kids feel like? Right. They are obviously the dumb ones in the, in the room. Yeah. And it is so depressing to see that instead of saying, hey, you know, give them something to, you know, give them something to do with it. Again, craft in German means hand. Do something with your hands. Right. And um, that is where the skill sets are for our community. It's mm -hmm. with our hands. We brew with our hands. We cook with our hands. We cut meat with our hands. We make breads with our hands. All this is hand in hands-on, but it requires your hands to do that. Exactly. But that doesn't make you not smart as compared to the smart kids that go to college. I resent that in every yeah. step of the way. And I think we will stop a lot of our school shootings and everything else if we give the non-college balanced kid an alternative. Mm -hmm. Basically what we do in education is we educate 25% of our population. Those are the ones who go to college. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, they whistle. Mm -hmm. They get some sort of primary education and then they're on their own. Right. And um, that's what we need to work on. It's the 75% and um, get them moving into this direction. Yeah, and showing them that there, showing them that there yeah, is a way. And I, you know, it can be from furniture making to anything. I mean, my God, the end, there are endless opportunities. Right. This thing that the global economy is going to kill all the workforce is a joke, yeah. it's an absolute joke. Yeah. So what would you say is your favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery <laughs> other than Weeping Radish? <laughs> I'm a great fan of Highlands beers. Uh -huh. um, and Red Oak, Red Oak does a um, Helen style beer that is excellent. Another um, lager house. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And um, obviously, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of. I'm a great fan of lagers, uh, yeah. no doubt about that. Mm. But that's, okay. you know, that's my heritage. I can't help it. I understand. So, 
Uh, what would you say is Weeping Radish's flagship beer? Not your personal favorite, but what would you say if there's one that represents the brewery? Well, it's interesting. There is now a beer. Um, it's called Yours Truly. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, <laughs> it's spelled T-R-U-L-I, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> and it wasn't my idea, yet again. <laughs> it was the North Kent Brewers Guild. Um, they mm -hmm. got together in, in, in Asheville uh -huh. and they brewed this beer in, in honor of, of our 30th anniversary. Yeah. And um, it was a wheat beer. And they really did their homework. And um, because our first beer we ever brewed in Mania was a wheat beer. Oh wow. The first brewer we had was a German wheat beer guru. His yeah. PhD was on wheat beer, huh. and he came to America and brewed a beer that was served for the first time on July 4th, 1986, and it was the best wheat beer I have ever tried. We could not give it away in 86. Yeah. Nobody knew what a wheat beer was. Now they would claim And the, now, my God, so the yeah. brewers, directors of the guild, brewed this beer and called it yours truly, and then brewed it in Asheville, and they were kind enough to let me have the recipe and the logo and the everything so now that's brewed with local that's awesome. Tr Triticum malt. so we're now doing it we've just launched it and um, so we now have yours truly available at the weeping radish <laughs> no, <that's> shameless self <laughs> promotion <laughs> but what can i say <laughs> that's fine that's great is that your favorite beer from weeping radish? in the summertime it is yeah it is yeah and schwartz beer in the winter our black radish in the winter time oh yeah um, black radishes we brewed that for the first time 86 and again Nobody knew what a black dark beer was. Schwartz beer was unknown. Oh yeah. Um, so you know, and we've done it consistently. Um, so it's it's those are the flagships really. Yeah. And look, we have a Corolla Gold, which is lovely. We're now doing that. We just got a new can came out, um, and we we have the Corolla Wild Horses in mm -hmm. Corolla, and um, we're doing a collaboration with the Wild Horse Fund. Oh, and, that's um, cool. We have that Wild Horse beautiful can um, with a um, Corolla Wild Horse on the can mm -hmm. and we do a donation for every can to the Wild Horse Fund and um, oh, that's, awesome. that's again it's part of this collaboration right. that microbrewers are so good at. That's amazing. And um, it's really fun. I only have a problem with political collaborations. We, the local lobbyist always tells us you need to entertain your politicians at the brewery. I have a problem with that because if you invite one party's politician um, and the, he has a shindig at your brewery then everybody assumes you're on his side. Yeah, uh, that may not be the case, and right. then you invite the other one, and he said, "Well, the other party was there just now," so it puts you in the political hot seat right. between the two. And I don't want to be in a political hot seat. Right. I just yeah. want to be the community, mm -hmm. and not a political party. So there, I have a problem trying sure. to pick pick what to do. Yeah. Beyond that, no. If it's a Corolla Wild Horse Fund, we're at it. We're doing it. Yeah. So I, I mean. I think it's probably the parents so far, but we haven't come right out and said that Weeping Radish was the first brew pub in the state. Yes. It was, um, so now, you know, not only did you open the first brew pub, you had to change laws to do it. You had the, not only like state laws and deal with local people, but then you're dealing with various regulations you have to deal with. I mean, just to get everything going. So now when you sit here, 30 years later, right? And and look around. I mean, how does that how does it make you feel to see basically not to overstate it or I, I don't feel I'm overstating it, but you know, in a lot of ways you started this and now when you look around, how's how do you feel? I only made one mistake when I passed that law. I should have written the law to say there shall be one and only one brewery in the state of North Carolina. <laughs> That's what I should have done and that would have been much better. I would have been the Caribbean somewhere on my yacht yeah. and then um, things would be much better. But um, no, that's not no. <laughs> Um, it, um, it is humbling, it is truly humbling to see this happening um, in both it, two ways. Mm -hmm. It is humbling to see this growth, not just in the beer but also the food side and the enthusiasm of people that are getting it. Mm -hmm. um, it is also humbling for me that my Bavarian folks from where I was raised, their breweries are now coming to America, um, right. looking at what we are doing, and they are now copying what we are doing and bringing it back to Bavaria. That to me is amazing because that's what I never, never, never thought and was ever going to happen. There, just exactly. I mean, yeah. they've got the tradition. My God, like nothing on earth. I mean, but they are look. They are seeing the advantages mm -hmm. of tradition. Uh, which is what they have, right. but it can lead to being stale right. versus our system of non-tradition but enthusiasm 
uh, has its disadvantages, but it also has its advantages, and, and we see the advantages here. Right. And um, uh, I just, especially if it all comes together, you know, it's not just the beer, but it is farming, it is food, it is craft, um, it is the young generation focusing on this, and we see change, and hopefully, what, what I really hope is going to happen, the, the problem with the old generation is the fear of the future. Mm -hmm. That's their problem. Right. And this generation is the optimism going forward, which is the opposite to fear for the future. Yeah. And that, to me, is, is I can walk around a microbrewing conference all day long, just walking around and looking at these kids and watching what they do. And now, of course, be it a compulsory, which is hilarious. But that's, it's, it's all fun. It is mm -hmm. all fun. But the optimism for the future is what this is really all about at the end of the day. And, of course, let's live healthier. I mean, my God, if you would have told me 40 years ago on the other banks we're going to have three breweries, one distillery, and five gyms, really, I would have laughed all day long. We didn't have gyms when we were younger. It didn't exist. We right. just sat back and did nothing. I mean, we worked hard, but we... You know, but we didn't do exercise. Right. Now this combination of healthier with exercise changes this country for the better. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. So, despite old white people, so <laughs> <laughs> I may have said that before. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a certain, there's a certain trend. Um, that, that's all I've got. And is there anything else you'd like to add to round out your story? No, I think this has been fun. Good. And, um, um, I'm sure you only wanted 20 minutes of it and you got an hour. Oh, but, um, I got plenty. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Not Thank at you all. So much. Not at all. Great fun. <laughs>